Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I am settling in for a discussional response to Lennon Smith. She had a really interesting video up recently called How to Use Your Weirdest Tarot Deck or My Weirdest Tarot Deck or something along those lines. And she explored her experience with the isolation tarot. I really enjoyed this concept of getting to know one of the less traditional and also less known tarot decks. It's not one that I have seen a lot of. And Lennon asked or sort of posed, I suppose, in the video that most of us would have a deck that came to mind, perhaps, if we were of the sort of more than a few deck kind of people, which of course I am. <laughs> so as you can see, I've got the hired tarot and hopefully this format is going to work out for me. When this hired tarot came to mind, it's one that I've wanted to discuss for a while. I've also wanted to review it. So this is definitely a discussional response to Lennon, but it's also sort of a review of this deck for those who are wanting a review, who are interested in my experience of it. I asked for feedback a while ago and people said that even with reviews, they like to see the decks in order because they find it easier to kind of ingest that information. So I have put my deck back in order. <laughs> I'm all prepped and good to go. I don't know that I would class this my weirdest tarot deck, but I think that that's more just about my associations with the word weird. And also the deck that Lennon showed definitely had extra unique offerings to it and lacked some parts of information that this deck does offer and does give. And therefore, it, it just didn't feel like it sat quite in the same realm for me if we were going to compare decks. But obviously, that's not what I'm doing. And I felt like it would still be really interesting because the idea of breaking out of our tarot shells is something I've also discussed. Uh, I enjoy that quite a bit about a selection of my tarot decks ones that still for me feel firm in their 78 archetypes or you know stories and what I mean by firm is they still feel like the tarot has a system but the system could be of its own making there could be sort of only half conforming to one of the traditional schools of thought or you get some decks where they kind of do a mishmash of several which really keeps me on my toes in particular the representation on the cards might be completely abstract there could be emergence like with this deck of sort of oracle like qualities you name it that's kind of how i consider uh, consider decks that do their own thing so as you've probably gathered by now, this is going to be a different kind of review. It's a review mishmash, but you can let me know what you think of it anyway, because I really wanted to respond to Lennon's video and kind of get involved in the discussion. That's something that I'm enjoying doing more of at the moment. This felt like a good way to bring those two things together. I think the a few advantages of this deck in particular is the guidebook I suppose because some of the ways that Dan briefly introduces his creation kind of clues you into the intention behind the deck and the deck has traditional suit names it has very common suit element associations all of the courts have the traditional names and so do the majors as well. So in that way, it, it sticks to like a very clear structure. I will just read it for you because I think who can say it better than the creator themselves? But Hyde Tarot was named based on the Hyde's that he and his friends do bird watching from and he talks about the link between what that hide represents and how the tarot represented that for him in particular 
And if you followed Dan's creation in more depth or you've seen any of the Kickstarter material, you'll know that he came or came back. I couldn't quite work it out to the tarot when his dad was terminally ill and they were going through that process. But here it says the overall mission for the Hyde Tarot was to create a deck that could be used both as a standard deck or as a series of abstract images and ideas, almost like an oracle. To achieve this, each card is given a subject, e.g. the mask, in addition to a traditional tarot card number, e.g. the Six of Pentacles. This applies to the Major Arcana too. And then he goes into a discussion where he says he hopes that people will work with the deck however fits them and their intention rather than feeling the need to just do it one way or another or feel sort of bound by the offerings in the guidebook. The guidebook offerings I will say whilst there's no indication that I can see on here that this is informed by a particular school of thought when I had a look I feel like it's clear in the meanings that it's influenced at least most by the Rider Waite Smith system. And I'll kind of get into the book more as we go along because it makes more sense to me in parts of the discussion as I go through the deck. What I will say is it's a very helpful guidebook. The meanings are concise, but there's you get a lot from them you get some keywords you get sort of like a I don't know what you would call this like an inspirational prompt at the end a discussion of the imagery albeit very concise and then a little meaning which as I say a lot of them have a very right away smith feeling to me but when you get into the deck it looks nothing like a right away smith deck at all and so that's why I feel like it makes more sense to talk about the guidebook as we go. This is the guidebook that comes with the second edition, so the reprint after the Kickstarter. One of the other things that I wanted to mention is that the Kickstarter one had a little bit more information about what the personal visuals meant to the creator. And I was fortunate enough to be able to get a copy of the PDF of that guidebook. So I was able to compare the two. And what I will say is it's not really a necessary addition, but it is a very intimate and enjoyable one. So I mentioned that because if people watch the Kickstarter reviews and then see these books, they're going to notice a difference. And also I feel like there's going to be that question about personal associations. There's still personal associations in here. It's just kind of a reference to things like, uh, from memory, I think he talks about a ring in a card and he said that it was a family ring. So sort of like a, I suppose it works like an heirloom or something that was handed down. And so not only do you get to understand why the ring was chosen, which is still in this, but you get that little extra emotive discussion in some of the cards it feels like it's helpful but on the other hand with a deck like this where the invitation I feel is to really kind of free yourself from the confinement of certain things it would be very easy for some people to just take his associations and kind of roll with them or feel like once they have that information it's so ingrained and personalized that they then can't look at the ring in another capacity so I, it doesn't really bother me either way, but I thought it was something worth talking about. So we're going to, we don't really need to see the box anymore, but just in case someone did want to see the box. <laughs> there you have it. I know this is something that interests people in reviews. I've kind of gone past caring about boxes, if I'm honest. And... It's gilded, but it's probably one of the only decks that's gilded that doesn't drive me nuts, along with, say, like the Brady Tarot. Is the Gentle Tarot gilded? I don't know. And I really don't know what to tell you about the cardstock. It's matte, but not in that 
flimsy way it feels like proper cardstock it's not too thick it shuffles really well so let's get into it and i'm not going to talk about every single card although i will definitely draw my attention to some in particular but i want to kind of share the experience that i have with this deck my thoughts and feelings you know the real personalized aspects which of course it may not be the case for you if you get this deck and you're using it but it's kind of where I'm at with this. And by the by, you can see the colour tone. It's actually a mixed media deck, but it does it really well, at least in my opinion. And you'll see that the keyword, so the tooth for this one, is actually larger and more dominant than the title, which I find really interesting. It doesn't distract me at all. I actually prefer it that way, but I literally couldn't tell you why. So we already get into how freaking abstract this deck is because we're at the tooth for the full card. And that's such a obscure place to start, I think. It's actually one of the more obscure cards. So if you want a quick taster before I go into my full-blown rambles, <laughs> where are the, the majors are at the back? The Fool, The Tooth, New Beginnings, Wonder, Naivety, A Shiny Tooth, Sharp and Clean, Just Emerging from a Soft Blanket of Gums into the World. Like a new tooth, this card represents a fresh start, striking out on a new path, heading off into the unknown. With all the tenacity and energy of a strong bite, this card is the embodiment of the phrase, Live while you're young, emerge from familiarity and safety and take a leap of faith. It's the feeling of excitement, of being spry and brand new. Welcome a new adventure. So this both works and I, I, I will be really honest, this both works and kind of doesn't work in several layers because I can tell that this, at least from the representation that I can see, it looks like an adult line to me and doesn't unless i'm forgetting something about lions isn't giving me so much of the fresh tooth in that capacity like the naivety but in the same vein it's clearly very clean it's clearly very flashy and fresh i get the bite part i get that our teeth are strongest when we're in our prime you know when They've strengthened, but they haven't had too much life. You know, it's still looked after. It has that quality to it. And then when I do think of it as the full card, which is why I suppose I, if I had been expressing it through the line, I probably would have done a cub just in for the idea of like the loss of teeth as well in the in that aspect. But I suppose the loss of teeth changes the it sort of is the focus of the of the fall, but then is it if it's the loss? I don't know because it does the loss of the tooth does kind of make me think of jumping from the cliff. But that's me going in very right away, Smith. Um, but I do think it's more of an abstract card for me than some of the others that will automatically make sense, which is one of the things I find in this deck. Some straight away. Others, they really invite that challenge because of this. The high tarot has never really felt like a beginner deck. Although there's always the caveat that you can start with whatever deck you want to. But for me, a beginner deck, speaking as someone who returned to the tarot from a very, I suppose, intuitive upbringing to it, and wanted to learn the Rider Waite Smith and tried to do so with the Wild Unknown Tarot and ended up getting some more Rider Waite Smith obvious decks to do that also. I feel like I speak from experience in that yes, you can of course start with whatever deck you want, but there's always going to be that difficulty of taking the information from one deck into another if it's not got some traditional lineage that helps you learn that lineage in the first place if that makes sense whereas if you do it the other way around I feel like it's a lot easier to veer from that at a later date 
But yeah, as I, I come to it, what I always laugh and say was the wrong way round. Of course, there's no wrong way round and it was totally fine. But speaking from experience, this feels to me like a palate cleanser when we're looking to shake it up after digging into whatever traditional schools of thought and, and those kind of like agreed upon layers that are facets of tarot history whatever tarot history you're coming at and then there's this invitation to kind of look at what connects the deck through similarities so like the wheel of fortune and the clover the clover just with those four leaves and the the links to luck if people know those associations of course i do feel that similarity again with a very rider waite smith wheel of fortune as as an example but this deck kind of breaks away from all of that and yet it still makes sense to me as a tarot which i was pleasantly surprised at as when I bought it, I would have been very happy to read it as an oracle. I kind of had that intention set before. And to me, this deck is kind of at odds with the concept of the traditional tarot. And yet, paradoxically, it fits somewhere in my mind, at least. Like what it does wonderfully is it challenges all those preconceived notions and expectations of like how elements are depicted, for example. By the way, I freaking love this deaf card and I think I've spoke about it in another video. But this is where the singular associations come in handy or just not in handy. They really come alive and into their own because this does not look like one of these statues but immediately because of my relationship to statue and death and those two concepts as a collective I think about Doctor Who and the oh, the name is going to escape me but you know the angels in Doctor Who right <laughs> you can't blink or look away from them because that shit is not going to go well for you, basically. And that's one of the things that immediately came to mind before I even decided to dive into the invitation to like, what else could that mean? We often put statues in place as representations and reminders of those who are gone before in the form of people or just in the form of a headstone, say. I know that's not really a statue, but can you see where it becomes sort of obscure and I start dancing away from even directly what I'm seeing but this whole connection comes through and in the same way I'm not really forcing that that's just a it was an intuitive hit and then it's more forethought and where else do statues come up for me and what else does death mean to me? And I could really get into that. I'm not going to because I feel like this is going to be rambly and long as it is. <laughs> Back to what I was saying. That was it. The elements and the way that that's uh shook up in this is really interesting and as we finish up the majors soon what a freaking interesting one for the tower <laughs> so strange to see a hagstone charm as the tower um that's another one that like i end up getting really poetic and even when I try and explore it, I will get really abstract because it, to me, it feels so abstract in the beginning, whereas the siren for the devil, not so much. And I find that that's interesting because for every one of us, you might not feel that the siren is obvious, but the charm will totally make sense to you immediately. That's kind of fun to me. I like that about the process. But I definitely remember when I was thinking about the elements in the cards, we'll see like vessel symbols in non-cup cards and a, a very pentacle looking symbol in not a pentacle card. 
that's another way that this kind of traverses those lines some of the symbolism feels like it flourishes through the relationship with like the individual archetype on a spectrum of of many possibilities like the bull is merely the the doorway and then we kind of filter off from that and it's very clear that then the creator pulls inspiration from metaphor, from archetype. Um, there's some mythology in here. I either read that or I've recognised it. I, I don't remember at this stage. And it comes together in this kind of art journal capacity. It definitely reminds me of old art journals when I was studying and other people's that they still do it. It hits a spot in my brain that it recognises it as like a visual language and it's it's no secret that I like to converse with artwork so to speak um meaning I, I put a lot of credit and value in the differing artwork from deck to deck and I you know my personal belief or gnosis or approach or whatever is that after crafting a foundational way to read any cards you know just to read the tarot that diverting from this in a creative intuitive and playful explorative way is something that really enriches the practice and the use of tarot and the diversity of the ways to use and enjoy tarot so I like to allow the deck's art to speak to me and with me if that makes sense like I said, I don't feel obligated by traditional meanings and like forcing them onto these cards. And so when we get into like the individual associations with an item, a symbol, an archetype, that's where it starts to become more personalised. But the deck is also more obscure. I'm hoping that I can <laughs> quieten the crashing about the noise travels terribly in this house, so I had to pause for a minute because my partner was using the kitchen, uh, which obviously we need to be able to do, but the noise travel is not so good. Uh, the animal associations in this deck in particular are an interesting one for me. Aha, sorry. But here's the card that to me looks like a pentacle card. It's called the jewel, so straight away there's a different invitation between the name and the visual which is why I enjoy both especially like I said that's why I prefer them being bigger because it's just a I guess a, a slight direction also an affirmation or not affirmation a confirmation sorry for people who might not be familiar with some of these things like the animals that's a stag you know this is a peacock it just it simplifies an otherwise very interesting and potentially challenging deck. And I like that that forethought was there. So the jewel, however, doesn't make me think of something like that. Jewels tend to have that translucent, glassy kind of quality there. It does make me think of things that are very highly treasured. And then obviously how we assign importance via our brain. So then that opens up the Ace of Swords to me and makes a little bit more sense just off of the off of the bat. I haven't actually pulled this card too much in my experience with this deck, but let's have a nosy at because I know that people are going to be interested. And of course, we don't have colour here, but straight away in the guidebook, we've got a flashy blue stone with an intense star-like pattern, power, clarity, truth. Occasionally, and of course, I've got a blue card next to it. This was not intentional. I actually have this in here for a different card. Um, occasionally, the glassy glare from the jewel can almost feel paralysing. A cloud passes, uncovering the sun, and a beam of light reflects onto the stone, filling the room. 
like a bolt of blue lightning, the icy shards of light pierce and strike, revealing the truth of a situation. It cuts through any confusion, allowing opportunities for new ideas, for finding solutions. The energy of this card is a wonderful eureka moment, a sudden brilliant flare of understanding. This card compels us to commit ourselves to honesty and objectivity, approach life with clarity of thought. It gives it a really different spin. So you see what I mean about the guidebook being quite helpful for those that are stuck. But I have to say one of the things that I've enjoyed about this deck in particular is getting to associations first by myself. That was part of the fun for me. Of course, I've I've read that one first and I have acquainted myself with the book, but I sort of had a look at the book, then had a look at the PDF, then had a while in between and I don't feel like my memory is good enough to have retained many of those associations at all. Perhaps a few of the personal stories that Dan shared in the PDF. I freaking love the vampire for the two of swords and this was another one that made a lot of sense to me immediately in that tear between the... I suppose the two paths and of course with the swords being an air suit I get that really obvious like bat being in flight and living within the air that's kind of a fun addition for me that I would go to with that one again it's not really necessary and what I said before is that I don't feel like vessels can't be in say the pentacles suits and I like it when when it comes to animals and that sort of brings me back to what I was saying I'm I'm okay with them not being tied into their like obvious suit and what I mean by that is I can deal with a fish that isn't in the cups so the water suit um it's not something that I find too much friction in well I don't find any friction in it but in this deck I haven't felt any that I can remember and the animal associations for me can go either way because they can be a lot easier because of my animal gnosis my daily animal practice animal working studies hand-on experience you know my real just passion for animals in general but it also means if they're on a card that I don't connect them to then of course that's that's more of a challenge like I said I don't recall that happening yet but hmm, it could right it could I'm enjoying the movement from the lily pads to the leaves from the six to the seven I don't know it's just it feels like even though they're not from the same plant that it's kind of it's it's linking them it's speaking to you through the you know the movement of one card to the other it doesn't do that too much I suppose there are a lot of plants here though we've gone lily pad leaves cactus uh and again, the cactus for the Eight of Swords to me is much more of an obvious one, which is why I ended up having that battle. Like, is this a weird deck? Is it an obscure deck? What word would I put with this deck? How do I explain that to other people? And I truly think the best way to explain it to other people is just to take you through it and then just share my experience. Because I think that how obscure or what kind of strange it is will be something that you get from looking at the cards and seeing how you do or don't relate to them in this instance like the eight of swords and the <laughs> you know how often the eight of swords is depicted in a way where it's like the person seems to have got themselves although there's never anyone around and it does kind of look like a hostage situation I'm not gonna lie but we're led to understand that this is kind of a self-imposed uh, concept, especially because whilst we get a physical representation, we're talking about the mind. And what I think about when I look at a cactus, 
like actually because again I'm quite a visual person I have um, a very active sense-based imagination what do I want to do I want to touch the freaking spikes what happens when I touch the spikes it hurts I mean not that much I've got chronic pain but <laughs> you get what I mean it's like when it says don't touch the hot surface and I know there's going to be a decent amount of people watching this who like me see the don't touch and want to freaking touch. Self-impose very much takes me there straight away. I, I, I mean, hopefully that makes sense, yeah. The Nine of Swords far more abstract, but I think I end up thinking about painting ourselves in a moment in time. And when we paint something, it's, it's sort of like putting a YouTube video out, right? Once we've done that, it's stuck in its moment in time. It's not a solid representation of how we may continue the discussion. It's not a representation of our growth moving past that moment. It's not a representation of anything other than that moment. And that's kind of the same with a painting. If someone's painted looking sad it might be the assumption that they were a sad person and it could just be that that was in the moment or they were asked or do you see what I mean? And I kind of find the Nine of Swords and the, the nightmare aspect and the way that we get locked into the thought as being the painting. I don't know, it just, it kind of makes sense to me. The egg is a great one for completion because it's got to, it's got to be destroyed to start again. And there's something really interesting about that as well. I think what might be fun to move on to now. And yes, I before I say that, sorry, the courts probably are going to be, I don't know, more challenging for people because courts tend to be a more challenging set of cards for the collective. Not always, it's definitely not a given. And um, I myself go through fits and starts, uh, definitely because I read the courts very different to how I was introduced to them in childhood, which again, no secret, wasn't a fan of that. Um, but yeah, I think that Sometimes when court cards are abstract, that's when people struggle, especially, like I said, a beginner or especially if court cards are very people specific in that if several courts come up, you would read them as several different people. Perhaps not. Perhaps someone really reminds you of Thistle and that would absolutely click for you. But they're more my, I suppose, observations I don't know. I'm probably just rambling. <laughs> that is kind of the idea of this video, but it's moving slowly, yes? It's an interesting way to review a deck, but I did want to return to reviews. And I, like I said, I did want to do this video. So I think that it's a nice way to do so. And perhaps some of my other ones will be less obscure. <laughs> it's... This is a funny one to me, but I'm not going to go into too much talk, like I said, about every single card. One of the things that I wanted to talk more specifically about was what I do when I feel more challenged by the association. So when it doesn't speak to me, and I will say that when it doesn't speak to me, this is when, you know, I'm... I'm reading it through tarot associations because there is always the potential to just use this as an oracle, right? But when something doesn't speak to me initially, I will then explore it through other mediums. I am quite analytical and definitely a researcher by nature. So, of course, Google reference materials that you know, include the said symbol being animal. That's that's kind of one of my go-to. So I wouldn't have difficulties with the B and the Eight of Pentacles, but just because I'm at the B, I might get one of my animal books out and look up B or uh, and their behaviour. And when I'm doing this, 
even though I'm sort of maybe tapped into that more analytical aspect at first with the research, which is, like I said, one of my go-tos, I will still then have intuitive or creative hits from what I've read. And that's when it begins a string of thought and connection and that web back to the tarot meaning that makes sense to me that's, you know, personalised. This is if I'm looking for connectors to the system. But honestly, I predominantly do read this as a tarot deck. Um, and the reason being is because whilst it does lend itself to Oracle really well, I... And, and you could go rogue and ignore the tarot associations. I have. It works well. But I don't do this often because I have other decks that do this, other oracles that I enjoy. And I really appreciate and find it fun, I suppose, to have the challenge of combining these with tarot. And I use the term challenge loosely in kind of a playful way because it's not a challenge like the fives are a challenge in tarot it's a choiceful one in more creative capacities i may look up the myth song poetry other art forms linked to this symbol so i would look up the leaf insect i may even look up the disguise and see what comes up there because there's kind of a twofold symbol here and then that could really inspire something as well, like the disguise. I definitely feel like reading um, why people use disguises in myth or some poetic words on a disguise would definitely prompt some ex extra forethought, even if I still wasn't able to like connect it to the Knight of Pentacles. To me, the Knight of Pentacles is a really interesting one as a disguise anyway, because they're a very interesting knight in comparison to the other three. They really stand out to me as kind of other than in their, their presentation of like how they action things, because I definitely tend to associate them with action and moving on something and there's a there's more of a slowness to the way they do it and there's just a different energy around it altogether the intent's kind of the same in terms of like night energy i don't know you can tell me what you think about that in terms of how i use this deck when I'm using it really archetypally, so thinking similarly to the way that I use the Wild Unknown Archetypes Oracle, so I'm working with like Fossil, I'm not thinking about the King of Pentacles really at all, um, or it's it's just, it's more of like a, a minute director as opposed to like the key facet because we're really focused on the fossil and the king of pentacles is more of a, an influencer to this then i would tend to just pull the one card from this deck and then chuck out like some oracles or tarot cards from a different tarot deck that's less abstract less obscure whatever and have that conversation that way because it is far more roomy but if I am doing more of a collective card reading which I find very easy to do with this then I'm just going to pull cards from this the difference being is that I might not get into the sheer depth of a singular card in the same capacity it doesn't mean that it's not meaningful um and I hate the word depth just because of how it's become in the tarot community i suppose but it's just it's not such a singular focus right it's more of a dalliance with my initial hits and my tarot associations and a nice gentle blending without so much of that and as i say because a lot of these cards do speak to me and this is a way that i have been challenging myself to read for some time this is not a new experience for me to push myself out of traditional tarot systems and also i have the benefit of doing the tarot stuff like i said the wrong way around backwards whatever it's not really 
But because I started off with the Medicine Woman Tarot, which isn't traditional in an obvious way, it kind of is uh, in the book and the associations, but it's definitely not always obvious. And then there was a layer of not having the big guidebook, only having the little one, not really using it, being taught to read quite intuitively with that deck in particular, and not having many other tarots, only one. It... It's, I suppose, something that I was fortunate enough to craft in this way. But I feel like everyone has the capacity to do that if they want to. It's just how you feel about it. Uh, I keep getting tempted to talk about particular cards, but that's not really a review. Uh, but I definitely feel like the goat is the five of wands and the five of wands being a challenging card links more to goat associations in like devil imagery than anything else or the idea of like butting horns which of course goats can do and I had a goat <laughs> uh, when I lived with my grandparents we had a goat that was one of the many animals that we had of course he was called freaking Billy because there was very little uh, creativity in naming the animals I did not name them <laughs> <laughs> and um, no shade but that's just how I felt about it uh, Billy was awesome and could definitely hold his own his best friend was our uh, Rottweiler Tommy and um, you did see that behavior but generally goats to me are very joyous and jumping around and just having a freaking good time like a goat for me gives me three of cups energy tenfold so that's where this is a really interesting diversion from like my go to. But I can get there really easily, especially with this imagery. I mean, come on, look at look at this book. Look at the mood of this. It has a vibe, right? And I'm, I'm here for it. I really enjoy the vibe. <laughs> Do you see what I mean about the mixed media kind of coming together? They're very different. This is probably one of the cards that's going to stand out the most in style from a lot of the rest. It has a kind of, I don't want to say simplified energy to it, but you get what I mean. There's less detailing and uh, line work, for example. Oh, I'm dancing around with low battery, so I may have to speed up or plug this in. Two options. We'll see what happens. I, I feel like it comes together really well. I don't know. Again, I'd be really intrigued to hear other people's opinions about that because you don't have to agree with me or even understand what I'm saying. That's the beauty of these discussions. That's what I really freaking enjoy about them, to be quite frank. We're kind of getting through more of the deck now, so that's good. Um, and hopefully my phone's not going to kaput on me too quickly because have we got one suit or two left? Oh, I don't know. I should be able to tell, but of course I can't. Here's the ring that I was talking to you about, by the way. How beautiful is that? Like a really personal little memento just hidden in plain sight that means so much to the creator as well. I get a lot of joy from things like that. And like I said, I suppose that for me was kind of the, oh, it's a shame that that was only in the Kickstarter but then it gives the people that back the Kickstarter that extra thing, that extra intimacy, that that thing that the people who get the deck later don't get, which makes sense to me because if you don't Kickstart, there's meant to be something that's usually the consensus on a Kickstarter. So one of the final things that pops to mind for me is... Uh, and again, I'm referencing Lennon's because this is a video response kind of deal as well. I don't write my own guidebooks per se. And with this deck, I think it's fair to say you don't necessarily have to, although how fun. But what I realised is that I kind of do something adjacent or even pretty much this way, but I've just not told myself it's that. And for many years now, which my Apple Notes can confirm, because <laughs> they are chaos, in that there's a lot of Apple Notes, like I should back them up. Um, I've been saving readings that I've done with certain decks and compiling them together in my Apple Notes in folders 
to return to and reflect upon but not for the reading per se. So it's never been for the intention to like see where I was at this place in time. I don't even date them. And you'll know that if you click on an Apple note and you accidentally like press a button, it will update it to the date and time that you pressed it and you can never go back. So there's no save dates or anything. Um, and I am a button pusher by accident, by nature. So it's not for the reading, but it, in the, what was happening in my life but the context of the card so what I read from the king of cups being the iris on that day and obviously I might get a couple of those and they are compiled over time so I suppose in that way without the conscious pressure of telling myself that's what I'm doing it especially because it's always been more sporadic and it tends to to be from readings that I share online somewhere. That's not always a given, but I do share a lot of readings online. I always have. It's kind of the easiest way I find to journal. And so I've compiled them from this. And this is one of those decks that I've done that with. So in that capacity, it's, it's I suppose I kind of do, but in my my weird little way that I just had never thought about before. Because I can't see my screen, I have no idea how long this ramble was. But I feel like I've spoken enough about my experience with this deck and kind of its quirks and ways that someone else might approach it if they want to. But I also am wary of making this longer in case it was very long and I didn't realise. <laughs> and the battery didn't run out so that's good I've I've saved my video and not lost everything always a bonus if there's questions that I didn't answer that you had about this then of course by all means like reach out I would love to hear your thoughts on this because it just deeply interests me even if it's just no I I don't like it when decks do this it doesn't make sense to me like that's okay you're entitled to your opinion. Obviously, don't hate watch and hate comment. Uh, no one's got time for that. But <laughs> you get what I mean. Uh, there, there's layers to like how we have different opinions and discourse and, and, and share thoughts, yeah? And I'm always deeply intrigued. So that is my Hide Tarot review and discussional to Lennon about one of my weirdest decks, at least in tarot land, because I got some weird oracles as well. <laughs> I hope that that was fun and I look forward to doing some more video responses or discussionals soon.